It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you, Speaker. <laughs> Speaker, my first question today is, uh, is for the Premier. Uh, Speaker, when families were losing their loved ones uh, to COVID-19 and long-term care, the Premier promised that they would get the answers uh, that they deserve uh, through a commission that the government established. Uh, that commission heard from Dr. Williams on Monday, uh, and two days before his appearance, uh, the commission received 217,000 documents uh, and uh, 2,000 uh, pages of handwritten notes from Dr. Williams, two days before his testimony. The notes were heavily redacted, and Dr. Williams' testimony uh, was interfered with constantly uh, by his lawyers, who were trying to, I guess, protect Dr. Williams from providing the information that people deserve. So if the government Question. and the Premier really wanted to get the answers for, for Ontarians, if they really respected them, why does this look like a stinking cover-up? I'm going to ask the Leader of the Opposition to withdraw. Withdraw, Speaker. Order. Order. The question has been placed. Minister, Minister of Health to reply. Thank you, Speaker. In fact, I would say to the Leader of Opposition, quite the opposite. Uh, we uh, set up and allowed the, uh, the Commission to operate because I know that there are many families that have inquiries. They were wondering what happened during the course of the uh, COVID situation thus far, and they, they want the answers, and we want them to have the answers. This is a truly independent Commission that is doing its work. Dr. Williams did appear before the Commission. However, there were some concerns with respect to some of the entries in some of his documents related to uh, Cabinet decisions that uh, it was the impression of Council that they needed to be protected and not released. However, the matter did go before a mediation. It was determined that all of Dr. Williams' documents should be submitted, and they were. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, unfortunately, Ontarians are going to keep wondering what really went wrong with the government's uh, response to COVID-19 and long-term care, uh, because this commission is not getting the information in a timely fashion that they deserve. They were, they were promised all information would be available. That's what the Premier promised. The Premier instead dumped 217,000 documents on the commission a couple of days before Dr. Williams' uh, testimony. His notes have been heavily redacted. Lawyers have intervened at every moment of the, Dr. Williams' testimony. Why is this government trying to prevent this commission from doing the job that Ontarians want and need them to do? Minister of Health. Well, in fact, the Commission has been provided with the documents. Dr. Williams' documents were not heavily redacted. They were provided in full. Dr. Williams provided his evidence. He has uh, answered all of their questions. We have provided all of the documents that the Commission has requested. Yes, there are 217,000 documents, because a lot has happened in the last year as we've been dealing with COVID-19 across very many areas. And so that is something I know the Commission is dealing with. But the reality is that we didn't sit on our hands in dealing with this. We took action on a number of fronts. There are many documents, and they have all been produced. The final supplementary. Everybody in Ontario has watched as this government has stonewalled this commission, not providing documents in a timely fashion, and now 217,000 documents all of a sudden being dumped on the commission, and the government refuses to expand the length of time this commission has to do its work. It is absolutely shameful. In fact, one of the commissioners, the commission uh, lawyers said this, it is a gargantuan task, almost impossible, to get through all those documents. Redacted notes from Dr. Williams, lawyers, have, uh, lawyers surrounding Dr. Williams, not uh, giving him or giving the commission the opportunity to properly question him. What is this government trying to hide from the people of Ontario? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Our government has been absolutely open and transparent with the people of Ontario since the day this pandemic started. Dr. Williams was given free reign to say whatever he wanted to say, and he did, in front of the Commission. Order. He produced all of his documents. His documents were produced, not redacted. 
The Commission has all of the information they need. Documents were uh, presented uh, quickly to the Commission. There is a large volume of documents to deal with because a lot, as I said before, has been done. But we have been open and transparent. We have nothing to hide. We have had a frequent uh, representations by Dr. Williams and or Dr. Yaffe before the public and before the media twice a week. We have press conferences Response. where Dr. Williams also appears. We have uh, modeling that's presented by Dr. Brown and Dr. Sander. We have dashboards that we produce to the public on a regular basis online. We are producing everything that we have. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is for the Premier, but I, I do have to say the only way that they can pull the knife out of the back of Ontarians is by extending the Commission's time frame and allowing them to do their work. But now I want to talk about yesterday, when we saw the Premier— I'm, I'm going to ask the member to withdraw that comment. Uh, speaker, Speaker— Speaker, um, I want to talk a little bit about yesterday, as seniors in our province are at, um, anxiously awaiting their chance to get a vaccine, the Premier stood in his place yesterday and suggested that somehow we're leading the country when it comes to vaccinations. And I can tell you uh, that that information uh, is, uh, is not actually accurate. Uh, in fact, Today, uh, we see the Quebec portal opening uh, and people are registering for their vaccines. Uh, seniors are registering for their vac vaccines. In Alberta, of course, their portal opened yesterday. 25,000 uh, Albertans were provided an appointment and they're getting their vaccines uh, come next week. Uh, you know, in fact, Order. the information the Premier uh, provided uh, is not accurate. We're actually seventh out of all the provinces when it comes to the vaccine rollout. So I guess my, my question to the Premier is, um, is he prepared to uh, you know, correct his record, uh, give people of Ontario the respect that they deserve? Uh, Thank you. Thank you. To reply, the Premier. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I know uh, the challenges when it comes to math with the NDP, but there's a million tests altogether. We've done 600,000. I think everyone Order. that can do math on this side, that's 60 percent. We have 38 percent of the population. And I love Order. how they, they compare it to other, other provinces here. First, first of all, I love the Premier of Alberta, Jason Kenney. He's working his back off. They have four and a half million. Stop the clock. Order. We start the clock. Premier can yeah, conclude his answer. Half million. We saw what happened out there. The system crashed. Now, my great friend, Francois Legault, which is one of the, the best premiers out there, um, they haven't even done one single second dose. We've done over 250,000 second dose. We are leading the country in vaccinations. But, Mr. Speaker, we're focusing on the, on, on the most vulnerable. The long-term care patients, the seniors, the, the, the hard-working health care workers that are out there, we have to get them vaccinated first. Do you know what the problem is, Mr. Speaker? We need the vaccines. That's Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, across our country, it's a race. The race is on between vaccines and variants. And Ontario, in, in our province, the actual variants are winning. And that is something that is really troubling to the seniors of our province. Uh, in fact, when our vaccines are being slow walked out the door, uh, when the government can't seem to get it together, uh, here's what Dr. S uh, Samir S Sinha says. With variants of concern that are circulating around and becoming the dominant strain, we're really worried that we're going to lose a lot more older people along the way. So does the government actually have any information about the numbers of seniors whose lives are at risk because this government has delayed the rollout of the vaccines until the middle of March? Well, again, through you, Mr. Speaker, thank goodness our government took action when it came to the airports where the variants were coming in by the truckloads. If it wasn't for us, there'd be more variants. So thank goodness we stood up the testing at the airports. We made sure we worked hand in hand with the federal government, which we appreciate. But again, Mr. Speaker, when you don't have any ammunition, you can't go to war. The ammunition is the vaccine. We need the vaccines. As soon as we get more vaccines, we'll make sure that we get people order. vaccinated. We'll start with 80 plus, which some areas are going to be starting because of the great leadership in the public health units. 
The final supplement. Speaker, here's what, uh, here's what matters to Ontarians. Uh, we have the highest number of COVID cases right now, 10,500. Ontario has the second highest number of deaths across the country, 6,893, and of course, tragically, 3,739 of those deaths were in uh, long-term care. And here's the problem. Order. 96 per cent of COVID deaths are happening uh, for, with people who— Please stop the clock. Come on. Restart the clock. Leader of the Opposition. 96% uh, of COVID deaths are with people over the age of 60, Speaker. Uh, they are most at risk of, of catching of COVID-19 in the, net, in, the, in the third wave. The variants are here. So the question to the Premier, Speaker, is with the COVID-19 uh, variants amongst us, with the fact that the Premier has reopened this province too quickly, with the fact that the, uh, the vaccines have been delayed so egregiously, uh, how is this government going to make sure that people get the vaccine that they need? Does he have a backup plan to ensure that people have the vaccines? Premier. Thank, thank, thank you for the question and through you, Mr. Speaker. Those are some numbers from that side. Now I'm going to tell you the, the, the numbers, that, the real numbers here. So the real numbers are we're leading North America, any jurisdiction our side, uh, size, with the lowest cases per 100,000. We're leading Canada to the exception of the small maritime provinces in the lowest cases. I'll read them out once again. Per 100,000 cases, Ontario is at 68. Those are staggering numbers. 68. Canada's average is 80. My great pal over in Saskatchewan, it's 121 compared to our 68. Alberta, which you're talking about, is 103 compared to our 68. Quebec is 93 compared to our 68. BC is 92. Manitoba is 87. And our great friends in Newfoundland uh, are out there, and they're, they're doing very well considering the, the outbreak. They're at 67. Again, Mr. Speaker, outside of the, the smaller maritime provinces, we are leading North America in every category from testing to vaccinations. We are the leaders here in Ontario because of the great work we're doing. Order. Opposition, come to order. The next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday, the Premier told personal support workers in Ontario that he really hopes he could give them a raise. But at the end of the day, that these things are just simply not up to him. Well, PSWs in communities like Brampton are wondering when they're going to see a permanent pay increase. So, Speaker, if the Premier is not the one in charge, who is? <laughs> Premier, to reply? Through you, Mr. Speaker, for the first time in Canadian history, we are hiring 8,200 PSWs. For the first jurisdiction in North America, we're going to have four hours of care. For the first time, we're seeing rapid builds. We're building thousands of beds compared to the Liberals. I think it was 600 they barely scraped by in 15 years. We're doing more in a month than they're doing in 15 years. We're going to continue building long-term care. We're going to make sure we enhance long-term care and improve the disaster we inherited from both the NDP and the Liberals, and we're going to end up hiring a total of 27,000 PSWs and nurses to fix the problem we inherited. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Um, and through you to the Premier, hiring them is one part of the solution. There is a retention issue because these are precariously low-paid employees. And so if we don't address that, you're going to see this issue continue on in the sector. Yesterday, the Premier also said that he's being lobbied every single day by PSWs who are asking him to keep his promise and follow through with the raises that they've been promised for almost over a year now. But he still continues to say that's not up to him. So, Speaker, again to the Premier, since you're clearly not the one making the decisions over there, who is and when are these PSWs going to get the permanent pay raise they deserve? And the Premier will reply again. Actually, uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to correct that, that statement if I can. I'll be lobbying everyone on this side. Yes, it's up to us. But guess what? For 15 years, they were underpaid. They never got a raise until we stepped up the plate and gave them a $3 an hour pay increase. And we will, in, we will keep that $3 an hour. Opposition has to come to order. Premier, conclude your camp. Your Thank game. you, Mr. Speaker. Through you, Mr. Speaker, we were the ones, after years of neglect, decades of neglect, 
We're the government that stood up and we're giving them $3 an hour pay increase, and we will keep that. We will make sure they're properly paid until we can attract more people to the great profession and their absolute heroes. I back those PSWs, and they all know it from day one. And maybe the opposition, leader of the opposition, might want to visit one of these long-term care homes and see the reaction I get when I go in there from the PSWs Order. and the nurses. I love them, and they love us. Certain members are completely ignoring my request to come to order. As if I wasn't here, I wasn't standing here at all, completely ignoring what I'm saying. We're going to move to warnings. The next question, the member for Sarnia Lambton. Thank you, Speaker. <clears throat> through you, Mr. Speaker, and through you to the Premier. Uh, Premier, I'm once again honoured to rise in the Legislature to speak to you about an important topic to my constituents and all Ontarians, in fact, the future of Line 5. The impact of Line 5 shutdown would be truly devastating, not only for Ontario, but for Michigan, Ohio and Illinois, as well as Quebec. A Line 5 shutdown puts at least 15 per cent of Northwest Ohio's fuel supply at risk, as well as more than half of the fuel, jet fuel supplies for the Detroit Metro Airport. Line 5 supplies 65 per cent of the propane demand in Michigan's Upper Peninsula and 55 per cent of Michigan's statewide propane needs. The light crude transported by Line 5 feeds refiners in the Upper West, Midwest and uh, Eastern Canada. Speaker, can the Premier please share with my constituents and the House the importance of the Ontario-Michigan partnership and the need to continue to work together on Line 5 and energy infrastructure projects on both sides of this border. Thank you. The Premier. I want to thank our great member from Sarnia Lambton for continuing to fight on, on Line 5 issue. I first want to take the opportunity to highlight the positive aspects uh, regarding our relationship with Michigan economically and the energy sector as well. Michigan is Ontario's largest export market in the U.S. and the largest source of imports, Mr. Speaker. It is Ontario's largest two-way trading partner in the U.S. with $82.3 billion in total two-way trade. Close to 600,000 jobs in Michigan depend on trade and investment with Canada. Michigan continues to be a major importer of Ontario electricity. Mr. Speaker, these are big numbers here. In 2020, close to half of Ontario's energy exports were sent to Michigan. That's 9,835 gigawatts compared to what we received off them, only 26 gigawatts. So that's good that we're exporting our, our energy down there. But Mr. Speaker, Thank you. Thank you. just one question. Thank you. Supplementary Jones? question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Speaker. And uh, my supplementary question is back to the Premier as well. Premier, as we have discussed Enbridge Line 5 crossing at the Mackinac Straits, uh, which, a line which has been in service without leaking since 1953, that is a track record of success and responsibility by everyone involved. For more than 65 years, Line 5 has delivered light oil and natural gas liquids to, that heat homes and businesses, fuel vehicles and power industry in the Great Lakes states. In May of 2016, during the Obama administration, the United States Pipeline and Hazardous Material Administration, the federal regulator in charge of pipeline safety, commissioned an extensive safety review that found no serious problems <coughs> with this operation. In June of 2020, a follow-up report concluded that a reported displaced anchor had no, placed no threat to the pipe, pipeline. If people know about these enhanced measures, Question. would anyone favor a total cessation of Line 5 activities as opposed to, say, fortifying? and potential weak points to further, uh, further reduce the risk of leak. Speaker, can the Premier please share what impact the decision of closing Line 5 would have on the working people in my riding and in the Great Lakes states and Quebec and Ontario? Premier to reply. I'd like to thank the member. The member is 100 per cent right, Mr. Speaker, about the negative impacts and this decision will have on the working people of Ontario and Michigan. James Williamson, a steam fitter in Sarnia said the pipeline's potential closure could impact workplaces like his. It would essentially shut down not only his work, but all the reciprocal jobs around the region. And he also mentioned three of his brothers also work in the petrochemical industry and would be out of jobs on Line 5 if it's shut down, Mr. Speaker. It would, quote, it would require us to travel and move our families 
lift their families up and move them out of the region to maintain income. You know, do you know what's amazing, uh, Mr. Speaker? Never in the history of this province has the pendulum, uh, pendulum ever swung so far. We now Spons? are the representatives of the hardworking private sector unions. And thanks to the Minister of Labour, the relationship he's built up with the steel workers, the steam fitters, the drywallers, the painters. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Adam. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is for the Premier. There are multiple serious outbreaks in Thunder Bay schools. Four so far are now shifting back to virtual learning. Lakehead Board trustees have voted to ask for all schools to go virtual. Teachers, education workers, and many others have done everything they can, but the situation is getting worse by the day. Unfortunately, our warnings and suggestions have been ignored, things like capping class size and more testing. When is this government going to start listening so we can keep Thunder Bay students safe and in school? Minister of Education, to reply. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there is a high rate of community transmission taking place within the community. We are going to follow the public health advice, the medical officer of health, the recommendation when it comes to keeping schools open. That is the mission of the government. But as we have said since before school reopened in September, I think what is a consensus, I'd hope, in this House, the risk within our community are reflected within our schools. It, it actually underscores the imperative of keeping uh, transmission down and keeping our guard up as a province as we deal with variants of concern. In the context of Thunder Bay, we have deployed additional investment, over $5 million for that, that board alone, in the context of COVID, for more hiring, for more staffing, for more cleaning. We've also mandated masking down to grade one, requiring a stricter protocol before a child enters a school and likewise the staff in the context of their screening. Uh, and obviously, asymptomatic testing is expanded and accessible within schools right across the north, including in Thunder Bay as we speak. We'll continue to be in Formed by the best medical advice to keep students safe, our staff Spons? safe, and keep the community rates down so we can keep our schools open. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, my question is again for the Premier. I'm glad you mentioned, uh, the Minister mentioned about community spread because Thunder Bay advised this government a month ago that there is a state of emergency when it comes to COVID. But this government's lack of investment continues even to this day. This ignoring of the urgency in Thunder Bay affects all of Northern Ontario. When the Thunder Bay Jail had an outbreak, there was very late response. This government failed. I have advised this government again and again about the limited capacity of our health care systems to handle this kind of crisis. Now, as my caucus colleague, the member from Kuwaitnungo, says, the COVID outbreak in Thunder Bay is threatening the people of Niskandiga, who are battling crisis after crisis. What is this government doing Question. for the people of Thunder Bay? This is an emergency. Why are we dragging our feet? Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I can certainly assure the member opposite that we are watching the situation in Thunder Bay very carefully. We are aware that there is a significant community transmission. We have put extra resources there. In fact, we've put over 20 more assigned provincial case managers and contact tracers. We are receiving the tests in uh, accurate timeframes. 97% of cases, we receive the uh, reports back within 24 hours. We have already invested over $2.7 million to the Thunder Bay Hospital to create 30 more beds. And we are watching the situation very carefully now. Uh, as a matter of fact, I spoke with Dr. Williams about it yesterday, who is in regular contact with Dr. Mill, the local public health uh, manager. And that is something where we are receiving recommendations from Dr. Williams uh, tomorrow upon receipt of data tonight to determine where Response. it needs to be placed and whether the emergency break needs to be applied there or what else should happen. So we are watching the situation very, very carefully and supplying extra resources to help Thunder Bay deal with the situation. Thank you. The next question, the member for York Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. For a year, the government is saying that it is listening to the experts. It isn't. Speaking to practicing doctors off the record, the majority will tell you that broad lockdowns are medical insanity. 
Focused protection is what's needed. Instead, the government is listening to public health career politicians, public health doctors driven by ideology, bureaucrats, many of whom have not seen a live patient in decades, pretending that they fully understand the predicament we're in. The same people that try to prevent the consumption of sugary drinks, now with unlimited power, believing that they can reorder humankind, ruining millions of lives without impunity, with deadly implication. My question to the Premier. By now, the Premier cannot deny that the lockdowns are deadly. Health, mental health, isolation, desperation, devastation. He knows it. Everyone in this House know it. So if it isn't about politics, if the health and safety of Ontarians are his first priority, and since we now know that lockdowns are deadly, then why are we still in lockdown? The response, the government house leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think the question really speaks for itself. Uh, we'll continue to uh, uh, listen to the advice of uh, the medical officer of health of the province of Ontario, uh, those of the uh, uh, medical officers of health in the 34 public health units across the province. We actually, unlike the member opposite, value their opinion. We value the hard work of, uh, of our medical professionals, be it the nurses, PSWs, uh, our, our doctors. They've done a great job, Mr. Speaker, and uh, we'll continue to follow their advice. Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, the, cover, the government house leader is talking about public health experts, but how about privately or in open letters in the Post in May or in the Star in early June or in the Globe in July and then in the Sun in November? Dozens of practicing doctors wrote to the Premier publicly begging for a balanced approach. How does the Premier not hear the suffering of millions of people? Why is he tone deaf, especially now that everyday Ontarians are no longer afraid to speak? no longer afraid of the politically correct mob to say that the lockdown is deadly. Can the Premier hear the millions of Ontarians pleading for some sort of normalcy, pleading to let their kids be kids again, pleading that he lets them work again? Now that we can all admit how deadly the lockdown is, why isn't he listening? Why is he continuing to imprison us? And is it because of politics? Is it because ending the lockdown now would amount to a devastating admission that everything he knowingly did since Question. the summer was a deadly mistake? Government House Leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Again, Mr. Speaker, this is a member of the opposition uh, who uh, voted in favour of every single initiative that this government uh, uh, brought in with respect to uh, battling the COVID uh, uh, pandemic uh, in March, April, May, June, July, August, uh, September, October. November and uh, December. He and the opposition supported every single one of those measures. Uh, unlike the member opposite, we value the work of, uh, of our uh, health care professionals. We will be continue to be guided by them. That is why we have uh, results that we have in the province of Ontario, and, uh, and uh, we are not going to let up fighting COVID-19 and keeping the people of the province of Ontario safe. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Sarnia Lambton. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker, and uh, to you and to uh, Associate Minister Walker. Mr. Speaker, I know that our government is working around the clock to help our economy recover from the unprecedented impacts of COVID-19. And as public health units across this province transition back to COVID-19 response framework, more Ontarians are going back to work. Unfortunately, tens of thousands of workers in my writings and across this province face uncertainty because of a decision made by the Governor of Michigan to threaten to shut down Enbridge's Line 5 pipeline. Can the Associate Minister of Energy please tell this House what this government is doing to defend these energy jobs in my riding and across this province? The Associate Minister of Energy to respond. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member, hardworking member from Sarnia Lambton for that important question and his leadership on this critical file. Last week, our government heard from concerned stakeholders in the Sarnia Lambton area during a roundtable discussion about the potential impacts of the Line 5 closure. Mr. Speaker, one of them, Ross Tyus from Local 663 of the Plumbers, Pipefitters and Welders Union, told us, and I quote, the lifestyle of Local 663's members would be drastically changed. On average, this industry and its construction partners put $300 to $500 million per year into the local economy. With Nova Chemicals' $2 billion investment here, Line 5 is critical to keeping the Sarnia Lambton community going. Mr. Speaker, as the hardworking member of the Sunny at Lambton said, 30,000 Ontarians and their families depend on the continued safe operation of this pipeline. I'm proud that our government, under Premier Ford's leadership, is fighting them every step of the way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. I appreciate the minister's efforts and this government to support the hardworking people of my community. Mr. Speaker, Line 5 is absolutely critical to our local economy and also critical to the energy security of our province and this country. Preventing this shutdown requires a Team Canada and, in fact, a Team North America approach. I am grateful that the Premier and ministers have been working with the federal government and with our neighbours across the border to resolve this issue. Could the minister further expand and tell us how important it is for us to be in this together? The associate minister of energy again. Thank you again for the question from the great member from Sarnia, Mr. Bob Bailey. Mr. Speaker, the member from Sarnia is absolutely right. For our government, the Line 5 issue is above politics. It's all about people. If the governor's decision to shut down Line 5 stands, it's not just the people of Sarnia and Lambton that will feel the impact. People and businesses across Ontario, Quebec, and Alberta, and Michigan itself, Mr. Speaker, will suffer. That is why we all need to be working together. I hope that the official opposition will join us in expressing their support for the many unionized jobs and the non-unionized jobs that will be lost as a result of this decision. I encourage them to join us in speaking up for those workers in tomorrow's take note, in today's take note debate. But regardless, I want to assure the member that even if they don't, we will continue to do so on this side of the House. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, and I'll, I'll remind members to refer to each other by their writing name or their ministerial title. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Agnes von Meren lives at 103 Avenue Road in a building owned by corporate landlord Hollyburn. In the last five years, tenants at 103 Avenue have had to pay for two above guideline rent increases, and now this corporate landlord has applied for another 11.3 per cent increase, largely for cosmetic renovations that not one renter asked for. Many low-income tenants live in this building, including seniors who are on fixed income. They fear they will be forced out of their homes and will have to struggle to find another affordable place to live in the most expensive city in Canada in the middle of a pandemic. The tenants at 103 Avenue Road want to know, what is this government's plan to stop unfair rent hikes in the middle of a pandemic? The parliamentary assistant, the member for Milton. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for that question, Mr. Speaker. Since the very beginning of uh, COVID-19, our government has called on landlords and tenants to come together and be reasonable with each other, and landlords and tenants across the province have shown the interior spirit by doing just that. In this, that spirit, Mr. Speaker, our government is stabilizing rents for Ontario's 1.7 million rental households, so the vast majority of families wouldn't see a rent increase this year. We thank the many landlords and tenants who have been cooperating through this challenging times, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Uh, back to the Premier. Uh, today's report from Renovictions TO found that above guideline increase applications have gone up 250 per cent in the last six years, and over 84 per cent of these applications are made by corporate landlords, intent on maximising their profit. Many renters across Ontario are already having a very hard time paying rent because they've lost their job through no fault of their own during COVID-19. Continuing to allow massive rent increases in a pandemic will result in economic evictions. It will force people to crash with friends, to look for another home, or even risk homelessness. This will increase the spread of COVID-19, and it will lead to more preventable deaths. When will this government start helping struggling renters instead of corporate landlords intent on making profit in the middle of a pandemic? The member for Milton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. From the onset of COVID-19, our government has introduced a number of measures to protect and support tenants, and any suggestion otherwise, Mr. Speaker, is completely false. Last summer, we passed the Protecting Tenants and Strengthening Community Housing Act, which mandates the Landlord and Tenant Board, LTB, to consider whether a landlord attempted to negotiate a repayment agreement with tenants before resorting to an eviction for non-payment of rent during COVID-19. This measure promotes repayment agreement over evictions for non-payment 
of rent and aims to maintain tenancies. Last October, we introduced a rent freeze, so the vast majority of Ontario's 1.7 million tenants will not see a rent increase in 2021. This is in effect from January to December of this year, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, member for Ottawa Vanier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ma, ma question en français pour le ministre. My question to the Minister of Education. Last June, the Supreme Court of Canada said that the right to education in French is protected by the Canadian Charter of Rights. However, there is a lack of French-speaking teachers, and teachers are not being taught in French, even though it is their right. This situation is an emergency in the middle of this pandemic. The context is difficult, but now we are in a crisis. In September, the government said that they would increase the number of French-speaking teachers in the province. So my question is, could we get an update on what has been done and how it helped with the image of, uh, of French-speaking teachers? The question the member opposite. Uh, appreciating that the challenge of French language educators has been um, has been with the province for well over a decade, but this government is resolved to fix it. That's why we, through the negotiations with the teacher unions and AFO, the French teacher union, we agreed to create a working group of boards. Uh, of union, uh, the Ministry of Education, that group has concluded their work. I've just received the report, uh, which provides a series of recommendations on how we can strengthen the hiring, both from the retention of French language educators in the province of Ontario and the recruitment of them, uh, both internationally and domestically through the College of uh, through various uh, colleges of education in the province of Ontario. We know this is an issue. It's a multi-pronged approach, working in collaboration with the Minister of Francophone Affairs, as well as the Minister of Colleges and Universities, to incent more in individuals to teach within our schools. We're very proud uh, when it comes to the funding of French language education. It's the highest levels ever recorded Response? in Ontario history under this government, and that will continue under Premier Doug Ford. Supplementary question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the the French language councils will need hundreds of additional teachers. The school districts association have raised flags here. We need, we have a good history of French uh, education, but we need enough teachers. There is a growth, an impressive growth in uh, the number of people who want to learn in French. It's about 110,000 students and their families who risk their French language education if the government doesn't act. The working group mentioned by the minister has tabled its uh, recommendations to answer to the call of fr for French language education. Is the government going to fund the putting in place of those recommendations? Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, we will keep our work with our French partners. To continue to support French language education. The member is right. We do see growth. 2020-21 estimates 1.6 percent enrollment growth for French language education, which I think underscores the value proposition that French language education is offering to the province. They've really been ahead of the curve when it comes to digital pedagogy, online learning, and quality education. So we're proud of that. It's why this government increased investment in French language education by 4 percent, the largest increase noted to date in the province. It's also why we convened the working group. Now, I assure the member, who I know, you know in good faith is very committed and very concerned about the matter, that we will be able to hire more French language educators working with our international partners. Uh, the parliamentary assistant and I have met with a variety of uh, consultants Response? internationally to understand how we can create a pipeline of recruitment to fix this problem once and for all and ensure French language students have access to quality teachers in Ontario. The next question, the member for Sarnia Lambton. So, uh, Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's a three peak. It's a three peak. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you for acknowledging me. And this uh, this question is to uh, the minister, Associate Minister of Energy. Uh, last week, several U.S. states were forced to declare states of emergency in the midst of this winter's cold snap. For example, 
the governor of Michigan declared a state of emergency on February 22nd, citing, get this, a propane shortage. Similar propane shortages in 2014 resulted in widespread price gouging and safety concerns both in this province and in Michigan. But the governor's decision to shut down Line 5 pipeline can only make things worse. <clears throat> Many Ontarians in rural areas rely on propane to heat their homes in the winter, dry their crops in the summer. Can the Associate Minister please assure this House that ensuring energy security for this province and Michigan is the top of mind for our government? The Associate Minister of Energy. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Sarnia Lampton, a.k.a. PMB Bob, uh, for the question and his great leadership on this very critical, important file. Members may not know that Line 5 supplies all the feedstock to the Plains Midstream facility in Sarnia. Shutting down Line 5 would shut down that critical facility, as well as the Plains facilities in Michigan, leading to price hikes and massive propane and butane shortages on both sides of the border. We want to avoid this potential crisis, and this is one of the key reasons that our government has been so focused on this issue. We continue to meet with industry stakeholders, union leaders, representatives from the state of Michigan, and others to advocate for the continued safe operation of Enbridge's Line 5 pipeline. I can assure the member from Sarnia Lambton that protecting our energy security is top of mind and that we will never stop fighting for the hardworking Here. people of Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for that. Mr. Speaker, the Minister mentioned that the closure of Line 5 would lead to supply issues that would result in everyday Ontarians paying more for home heating oil, more for gas in their cars, and more at the grocery store for de groceries delivered by truck. Can the Associate Minister please tell us more about the specific ways in which a Line 5 closure would negatively impact affordability for Ontarians? Thank you. Again, the Associate Minister for Energy to reply. Thank you again to the hardworking member, and without a shadow of a doubt, I can assure him that we will do everything in our power. Here, here. Propane is the only one of the products produced in Sarnia's refineries that insurance use every single day. Line 5 provides raw fuel to Sarnia's refineries that produce gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, plastics, and chemicals. In fact, Line 5 delivers 53 per cent of Ontario's crude oil supply and two-thirds of Quebec's oil supply. When Ontario businesses are forced to absorb increased costs for products like gasoline, these costs are passed on to the consumer. Mr. Speaker, this is unacceptable. Hundreds of thousands of families are already dealing with the negative economic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. The closure of Line 5 would deepen these negative economic impacts and would be felt in every corner of the province and, frankly, across our great country. Mr. Speaker, our government will continue to fight for our energy workers and Ontario families by defending the continued safe operation of the Line 5 pipeline. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, doctors have called Scarborough ground zero for COVID-19. Scarborough is home to many frontline essential workers, many of whom are low-income, racialized, and facing increased risk of COVID due to the nature of their work. Constituents are writing to us every day worried about the government's slow and confusing vaccine rollout. Mr. Speaker, despite the, despite the fact that doctors have the ability in Scarborough to administer thousands of vaccines per day, but due to the lack of supplies, they are not able to. Why has this government not allocated an equitable amount of vaccines to the heart-hit regions like Scarborough? Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Health. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. And as the uh, member opposite knows very well, there have been limitations in the supplies of both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines over the last several weeks that have, uh, in fact, slowed down somewhat our vaccination efforts. But we're ready to go as soon as we receive them. We're ready to go in terms of mass vaccination clinics, clinics that uh, uh, local health care practitioners can have in their offices, in pharmacies, in every, every possible way forward. But we need that supply of vaccines. We expect the supplies are going to increase significantly within the next few weeks, and we will then be able to proceed. But we are allocating vaccines according to populations across the province. Each area is receiving their equitable volume of supply, but we are uh, putting extra resources into some communities to allow for greater response. testing, to allow for greater response. And so we hope that very well within the next few weeks we will be able to ramp up quite rapidly our vaccination efforts to uh, do 40. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, with all due respect, a number of our vaccines were stuck in the freezers. 
for weeks and weeks, and a number of the allocated ones that were to, given to Scarborough were actually sent off away from Scarborough to other regions that were not hit the same way as Scarborough was. Scarborough has experienced record high positivity rates throughout this crisis. Recently, almost half of the province's ICU cases were in our community. But despite the fact that Scarborough is still COVID hotspot, and despite the fact that families and workers in our region continue to be at bigger risk of the third wave, yesterday's announcement about the vaccine rollout was a, not, was a confirmed, was con is, is a confirmation of our worst fears, really. The province still doesn't have a plan to keep our communities and our families safe. Mr. Speaker, my question to the Premier is, will the Premier commit to an equitable vaccination strategy that takes into account hard-hit communities and regions like ours in Scarborough. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, just, I think it is important to uh, stick to the facts. And the facts are, Speaker, that there has been uh, no, no vaccines are sitting in freezers anywhere. They are being uh, put into people's arms as quickly as possible. And in fact, we have had over 620,000 vaccines administered to date, notwithstanding the supply issues that we're having. So we have made sure that every part of the province is receiving an equitable amount based upon their populations. And as part of the vaccine task force, I can assure the member opposite it, that there is a bioethics table that has been reviewed, that has gone through the framework, that is making sure that it is fair and equitable to every community within Ontario. And I can also indicate that we have already set up, launched what? and implemented our high priority community strategy which is providing $12.5 million to lead local agencies to work in partnership with Ontario Health, public health units, and all of the other supply providers. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, member for Don Valley East. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the minister responsible for children. Speaker, Ontarians are so disappointed in this government's handling of autism services for children. But this disappointment was brought to an all-time low a few weeks ago when the minister announced a new plan. Families were completely shocked, Speaker, to find out that under the minister's new plan, people assessing the needs and services of children with autism would, would be someone with literally one day of training. Previously, this was completed by a psychologist or a behavioral analysis with years of training and education. Speaker, through you to the minister. How does the minister believe that someone with one day of training is qualified to assess the complex needs and services of children with autism? Minister for Children, Community and Social Services. Thanks respond. very much. And it's uh, great to get a question on the autism program. And I'm really, really pleased to stand here today and talk about the progress that we're making on the new needs-based program here in Ontario. Uh, in just a week or so, we'll be bringing 600 children into the new needs-based program, Mr. Speaker. And uh, we'll be using all of the tools that have been designed by our expert panel. We had uh, folks uh, who worked uh, over the summer of 2019 on the autism advisory panel, bringing forward recommendations, over 100 recommendations in that uh, very substantial document, Mr. Speaker. One of the recommendations was that we have an implementation working group, which is made up of clinical experts and those who are research experts, as well as, well as those with lived experience, uh, Mr. Speaker. So for the first time in the province's history, we've actually gone to the community to design a program for the autism community. I'm really proud of the recommendations that Response. have been brought forward, Mr. Speaker. We're following all of those recommendations, including the care coordinator uh, that the member opposite is speaking about, and I look forward to answering more in the supplementary question. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, I, I don't know if, uh, if you noticed, Mr. Speaker, but the member didn't answer the question. It was a very simple question. But this minister, like his predecessor, continued to make promises, and these promises are not kept. Perhaps the minister is too distracted for ways to looking to make cuts to social services during a pandemic. I'm not sure. But, but Speaker, when it comes to autism services, this government has let families down every step of the way. They promised to eliminate the wait list. They doubled it. They promised to fund the program to $660 million. They didn't reach that target. And the minister said that by April of last year, not this year, last year, he would actually have a needs-based program. So he made reference to 600 kids getting services. Speaker. There are literally 1% in that program, 1% of the kids on the wait list are actually going to get service through his new plan. So can the minister please tell me, 
Why can't he take this, this file seriously and put in place a program to help children in this province? Because we're missing an entire generation because of his lack of effort. Question. The Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Mr. Speaker, when this minister or this member was the minister on this file, less than a third of the children in the province of Ontario were receiving any support from Order. the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, we have doubled the amount of funding in the Ontario Autism Program from $300 million $600 million. Order. Member for Don Valley East come to order. The member for Northumberland, Peterborough South come to order. The Minister of Children and Community <laughs> Social <laughs> Services respond. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Speaker. For the first time in the province's history, Mr. Speaker, every child that is registered with the Ontario Autism Program is receiving funding. From that program, Mr. Speaker, that's something to be celebrated. When this member was the minister on this file, less than a third of the children were receiving support. We brought in all kinds of different programs, Mr. Speaker. Family foundational services are now available to every family in the province response? as soon as they get their diagnosis, Mr. Speaker. We're creating an urgent response crisis program, Mr. Speaker, that will be there for families when they find themselves in crisis. This is going to be the gold standard for Thank you. The Premier. My community of York South Waston is very disturbed by the news that a new slaughterhouse is opening up in the Stockyard district. Our office has endured it with emails and calls objecting to this facility. The previous slaughterhouse was closed and had its license revoked to many health and environmental violations. An environmental compliance approval was granted to the farmer owners despite nearly 100 complaints in public consultations in 2018. How did this new facility get approved and why was the community not consulted? The government house leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, while I'm not specifically aware of the, of the file the member is, is talking about, I can say that uh, obviously agriculture is an incredibly important part of, uh, of the economy in the province of Ontario. There are a tremendous amount of farmers, including those in my riding, uh, quite frankly, that are responsible for hundreds of thousands of jobs and billions of dollars worth of economic activity, and we will continue to support them. Obviously, the Canada Food Inspection Agency has a big role to play when it comes to uh, 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 slaughterhouses and, uh, and the regulation uh, uh, of those and the inspections uh, of those, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, but look, this is a very important industry uh, that is uh, important to, uh, to the economy and obviously important to, uh, uh, to, uh, to all uh, Ontarians. And uh, I would hope the member would, uh, would welcome uh, the jobs in his community and we will make sure, of course, working with the Canada Food Inspection Agency, that it remains uh, a safe place to do business. Thank you. Member for York Southwestern, supplementary. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The community is not against uh, jobs. They want to be consulted, and the rules are followed. In 2019, this government announced it would no longer be enforcing environmental standards related to noise and order from facilities like this new slaughterhouse and downloaded those responsibilities to municipalities. When is this government going to lead by taking action to ensure? A new environmental compliance approval takes place before the new facility opens in March, and why are they downloading noise and environmental order complaints to municipalities? Why are the oh, order. <laughs> Government House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Look, Mr. Speaker, uh, the food processing is an extraordinarily important uh, uh, activity. Our farmers do a tremendous, uh, a tremendous job in, uh, in helping to ensure that we all have food on our table. Uh, we work very closely with the Canada Food Inspection Agency to make sure that uh, uh, these types of facilities are, are monitored and work in, the, in a, a safe, humane uh, way. This is, a, is an opportunity to bring hundreds of jobs to a community that I know this gentleman works, uh, this member works very hard for and advocates for. He's had brought a number of bills uh, uh, before this House to advocate for his community. Here's an opportunity to bring more jobs into this community, to expose the community to uh, uh, the good work of our, hard, uh, of our hardworking farmers. I hope he would encourage uh, uh, this type of job creation in his uh, riding. Uh, I'm always excited when we hear of, uh, of new opportunities in, in communities, and uh, I like to celebrate the hard work of our farmers, and I hope he would do the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah.
The next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. This question is for the Premier. Last week, the FAO released its latest report on Ontario's labour market. Ontario lost 355,300 jobs in 2020, the largest decline on record. Youth unemployment dropped to its lowest level in 20 years, while their, sorry, youth employment dropped to its lowest level in 20 years, while their unemployment rate skyrocketed to 22 percent, the highest on record. Statistics Canada's Labour Force survey, to no surprise, shows that the most impacted groups are Black, Indigenous and people of colour, women and youth. The K recovery in Ontario is a direct result of this government's inaction. As each month goes by in this pandemic, all of Ontario's youth can expect that they are further and further behind in this economic recession with no relief in sight. Question. A core economic strength is our people, Speaker. My question is, in the budget coming up, will this government reverse its cuts to OSAP and for post-secondary education and free tuition? Thank you. <laughs> to respond, the Minister of Labour. Training and skills development. Thank you very much, and I know the parliamentary assistant uh, to colleges and university uh, will want to speak to this as well. But, Mr. Speaker, one of the things that we can all be proud of in Ontario is the government's commitment to getting young people uh, into the skilled trades. Mr. Speaker, there are literally hundreds of thousands of opportunities over the next uh, 10 years for people uh, in the skilled trades. I'm really proud of our government's historic investments into pre-apprenticeship programs. Uh, to the member that asked this question, a pre-apprenticeship program gives an opportunity uh, to young people to uh, try the trades for a period of uh, 12 weeks uh, to uh, get a work placement. And Mr. Speaker, I'm really excited to share with this House that on Sunday night, I had a great call from a young lady uh, in Toronto, Natisha. Uh, in her words, Mr. Speaker, she uh, was Response. on welfare. She was a single mom. She got an opportunity to join the trade. She is now an iron worker. And Mr. Speaker, she is earning $44.08 an hour, and she has pension and benefits. The supplementary question. Speaker, we didn't hear an answer because this government is not prioritizing the needs of youth. Last week's FAO report highlighted another troubling trend when it comes to women in this province. Women experienced a 5.8 per cent job loss compared to men at 3.9 per cent. The she session continues to deepen, with a large amount of job losses for women happening in the cultural and recreational sectors. All the service sectors, Speaker, are hardest hit by this pandemic, and these jobs are not coming back soon. If this government does not start to value the work women are doing in the workforce in Ontario, we will see more women drop out of the job market altogether. We need to start to value women and the contribution that they make. The care economy, which includes health care, elder care, are more importantly staffed by women and require more supports, like early learning and childcare. Speaker, will this government tell us where on the list of priorities is the investment going to be made in this budget into the care economy so that women can have equal economic opportunity and can recover fully from this? Thank you. Yeah. Of Labor. Mr. Speaker, thank you to the member opposite for this very important question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, our, our government every day is working to spread hope and opportunity across the province more widely and fairly. We know that good, meaningful jobs uh, uh, change lives. They strengthen families and all of our communities. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm proud of our redesigned second career program that we launched uh, back uh, late last year. $77 million investment to uh, really focus on those that have been impacted uh, by the pandemic. Mr. Speaker, you know, I have many young people, many women come up to me and they say that in Ontario, because of previous governments neglecting the apprenticeship system, they'll say to me, um, you know, Monty, I know to become uh, a teacher, I know to become a lawyer, but I have no idea uh, how to get in, into the trades. And Mr. Speaker, it's up to Response. all of us to tell the young people the opportunities available in the skilled trades. There's 144 to choose from, and our government is investing records amounts of money to get people Thank you. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Okay. There's quite a conversation going down, uh, down the, the end of the chamber, and I'd ask you to wait a few minutes and maybe take it outside. 
The next question, start the clock. Member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Niagara has the third oldest, oldest population by average in the entire country, and our seniors are at greater risk of getting COVID-19. Given the over 200 outbreaks and more than 360 deaths we've had across the region, Niagara is a high-risk zone. It makes sense that we be given our fair share of all available COVID vaccines. Yet in early January, we found out that 5,500 doses of life-saving Moderna vaccine promised to public health was sent elsewhere at the expense of health care workers and seniors. Mr. Speaker, my question is the same question that our doctors, public health, Niagara Health, health care workers and the residents are asking this Premier. Where were our vaccines sent and why were they diverted? And will he immediately send Niagara its fair share of both vaccines? Government House Leader. Uh, sorry, Mr. Speaker. The member will know that uh, that actually is not the case. Uh, as uh, the Minister of Health uh, highlighted the other day, all regions are getting their fair share of uh, vaccines. Uh, there was a, uh, obviously in our, in our vaccination plan, uh, we, we highlighted or focused on uh, congregate care settings, uh, long-term care homes, uh, retirement homes, uh, and we were making sure that the vaccines were in place to cover all of those people. Uh, uh, on that, in, in those in those settings, including uh, healthcare workers, Mr. Speaker, uh, there was a switch between uh, Moderna vaccine and Pfizer vaccines, but uh, uh, at no time was uh, was Hamilton or was Niagara uh, shortchanged of any vaccines, Mr. Speaker. And I uh, I completely reject what the member is saying. It is a dangerous thing for the member to be saying we should be all working together to make sure that we all get vaccines and uh, and uh, help in, in in defeat COVID-19, not spreading. Uh, False allegations, Mr. Speaker. Member to withdraw. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it is ac absolutely accurate. Yesterday in this House, the Minister of Health said, when referring to COVID-19 vaccines, I can assure the member opposite that Niagara did receive its fair share. Niagara doctors disagree, and a letter to the Premier asked for our, and I quote, fair share of vaccines. Is the minister saying our health care workers aren't being honest? The doctors also said our teams are burnt out. People are worried for their loved one. They need hope, and hope was the vaccine that offered. It doesn't make sense that life-saving doses of vaccines were diverted from the Niagara region. In one month, hundreds of seniors died in Niagara, and there is a death every 3.5 hours over a seven-day period because we didn't get our vaccines. When will this government be open and transparent with the people of Niagara and let them know where the much-needed vaccines were diverted to? And it is accurate. So, Mr. Speaker, I think today we've uh, we've seen the uh, the opposi opposition reach really a new low. What we're seeing is uh, is opposition members pitting region against region when it comes to the uh, the fight against COVID-19. We've heard it from heard it from the Liberal member, and now we're hearing it from this member. Uh, no region was shortchanged, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the vaccines that they were due. You've heard the Minister of Health say that it was based on population, but it was also based, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, on uh, on on what we were doing. Uh, with respect to Order. initial vaccinations in congregate care settings, long-term care homes is what we were focusing on. Retirement homes is what we were focusing on. Health care workers is what we were focusing on. The very same people he references Remember in this for question, Niagara Falls, the come very Order. first people that we were focusing on uh, with respect to the vaccinations, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to work on behalf of all of the people of the province of Ontario. We Member for Don Valley East, come to Order. Minister of Children, do Community Services, are doing Social Services, come to Order. That concludes our question period. Order. Government House Leader will come to order. The member for Windsor West will come to order. The member for Niagara Falls will come to order. Okay. The member for Niagara Falls is warned. The government House Leader is warned. We have a deferred vote on the motion for second reading of Bill 238, an act to amend the Workplace Safety and Insurance Act 1997. The bells will ring for 30 minutes, during which time members may cast their votes. I'll ask the clerks to prepare the lobbies.